All right, oh. let's go. So, are there any, did anybody have any thoughts or reflections or questions or anything that that's just what we've talked about so far before I go on? How's it, how's it, how's it going? Yeah? Am I holding your attention? Absolutely. Okay. That's important to me. Well, nobody wants to leave, so I have to Nobody wants to leave. Um, so I have a whole bunch of things, and as you can see, I'm sort of jumping around depending on what the questions are, and because I think that's more interesting than, Organic. yeah. Um, but I think what I want to switch over to is implicit memory, um, because we talked a bit about the body, and um, it used to be thought that procedural memory was just about the body, like riding bicycles or playing tennis or whatever. But now we know that um, implicit memory is also emotional memory. And of course, emotional, relational memory is the memory that's most important for what we do as therapists. And um, so implicit memory uh, developmentally, did you do any developmental stuff or not? Not today. Not okay, today. good. So uh, just a tiny, tiny bit that um, when the baby is born, the um, first type of memory on, online is implicit memory. And for the first two years of life, that's the memory, um, that's the learning system. So learning and memory are really interchangeable. When you talk about learning, then you're talking about memory and vice versa. And so for the first two years of life, um, the Bowlby's uh, working models, internal working models, are all part of implicit memory. And so what the baby is doing is learning sequences. So going back to this joint idea and the transition idea, the baby cries, then what the baby learns is what happens when I cry. Does what? How does mother respond? Does mother come in and soothe me, or does mother put, give me a horrible face because she's freaking out that I'm upset? And that linkage between an emotion and a response and then a series of sequences gets internalized as implicit memory. And that memory, so, so um, that sort of memory is the most important one and the foundation, and it's, that's the affective foundation for everything else in the brain. And if that goes bad, um, then cognitive function and everything else is going to go off uh, down, down the line. But that's the ki a kind of memory that doesn't get called up as an episode. Um, it gets, and it's right brain, it's, um, so implicit memory is guided by the right brain, and the right brain has a more direct um, connection into the body, partly through the autonomic nervous system, and so the brain and the um, spinal cord are part of the central nervous system, and the autonomic nervous system is what regulates arousal. And so the sympathetic is the up is the stimulating um, uh, kind of arousal, and the parasympathetic is the soothing kind of thing. And so uh, the ideal mother-child relationship is um, is is it attuned enough so that the emotions are regulated rather than dysregulated? That's and so you um, and is this this is all review, right? Mm -hmm. um, for for everybody that you've um, kind of studied that. And so if uh, their emotion, these emotional sequences are regulated, then the baby is securely attached and can stand the range of emotion as, as he or she gets older. Um, and if it's dysregulated, then that's what sets the course for psychiatric and, med and or medical problems uh, down the line. And um, there, there's a lot of research that shows, um, that shows that connection. And I believe that, um, this is sort of an interesting thing, it's that there's no research that I know of, but um, tell me if this makes sense to you. That although we the the that we as adults can't reach back into those that very very early history, um, 
we we know it's in the body, and so the the body. So some sometimes working somatically is the way back into what what that's like. But I also think that it's in the landscape of repetitive dreams. So um, back, back to Jung. Huh? Back to Jung. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that the it sets what what that what implicit memory does is set the tone, the emotional tone for life, and the sort of the feeling of the world. And so, when people have repetitive dreams, those are the ones to pay most attention to. By the way, I always want to know what people's repetitive dreams are because that that's the that's the sort of there's some some kind of glitch point that. A person is returning to and um, and so I think you can get the feeling of what that implicit uh, emotional landscape was like through looking 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 there so let me let me tell you this clinical story because I know that that's of interest is, is to hear stories and so um, it's a it's really a story of implicit memory and intergenerational memory and this is so this is a patient um, I, ha I have a few patients I, I do long-term work primarily and so I'll see people from anywhere from a year would be a short long-term to um, decades if someone is either severely traumatized or has severe character disorders borderline or narcissistic um, or uh, dissociative identity disorder. So, um, and and a number of these long-term patients, um, I just are so informative to me about everything. You know, I, I just can learn so much from deepening the work. And so, this is a patient that um, I've seen for a very long time, who came from an incredibly traumatized background. Um, she's Chinese American, and grew up in uh, Chicago, and um, it looks like her father um, uh, had been sold as possibly a sex slave um, back there, and um, had a bicycle accident, and may have fallen on this part of the brain so that the executive functionings are, were gone. And so there was a lot of uh, physical abuse between father and mother, and then the mother um, was the child of a, a, a woman who, upon giving birth to a baby girl, threw the baby girl on the ground trying to kill her um, because she didn't want a girl. And so um, you can imagine what that kind of trauma at day one would do to someone. And then the two of them together um, made for uh, incredible poverty and um, a lot of physical abuse and also sexual abuse, um, ancestral molestation um, with, with my patient. But something about her was just incredibly resilient and into to be able to kind of get out of that environment um, very very smart and she went to the University of Chicago and uh, became a lawyer and is really high functioning and so this combination of being really high functioning on the one hand and having this incredibly traumatized background is to me very very interesting and very um, rich as a as a way because when somebody can cognitively get what needs to happen and and you know ha and facilitate the work that way it's it's so very interesting. So she came for therapy because she was abusing her um, boyfriend and at that point um, <coughs> her fiance and she wanted to break the cycle of intergenerational abuse. <laughs> what, I, I, I'm just curious you, know, whether it's too much. Just identifying the information or, or is she she knows you're sharing? Oh, uh, well, she I've written about yeah, yeah, her yeah, so yeah, and check. she's read what I've just written checked. and so yeah. abusing yeah. in what way? What's that? Abusing in what way? Um, she would hit 
um, and at one point did stab, uh, yeah, did stab her boyfriend, um, fiance. And but she and and when she went back to China at one point, um, all of the relatives there is like a little tiny village in China, and all of the relatives were physically abusive. And I mean, it's absolutely clear that this was going back generation after generation after generation. And so she wanted to get hold of it. Um, and which is, I think, a really noble thing to to want to do. Um, and so fast forward many, many years. So she um, she really stopped being um, physically abusive. Um, she's gotten more and more of a, a, a handle on being emotionally abusive. She could feel her frontal lobes kick in because it's really, I think, very important to give a clinical narrative that includes what's happening in the brain. It's very useful for people to um, kind of understand it. It helps reduce shame for these kinds of, of things if they, if, you know, if they kind of understand that there is a real concrete material basis for, for what's going on. And um, so this, this is all a prelude to the story of um, this woman having a baby. And um, the same thing that I was describing with the other case where she would be bringing the baby in each session and I would hold the baby and I would, you know, be soothing her, be soothing the baby. And um, it was really, uh, a, you know, very lovely. This, this baby was very cuddly, so it didn't, this, there wasn't that same sort of um, problem with, as with the other baby. So one day, uh, this woman walks in with a baby in the baby carriage and the baby is like glued to her face, right? She's walking in, the baby has got her, the eyes glued to her face. She walks through the door and she says, um, I think the baby is fascinated with your door jam. And I said, I said what are you talking about? Because I, you know, the baby's like this, you know, like totally eye to eye thing. The baby's probably like three months old at that point. And she said, yeah, the baby's looking at your door jam. And I said, no way, the baby's looking at you. And she said, no, that's not what's going on. And I got totally alarmed inside because that kind of eye to eye contact is so important. I mean, that is like the, you know, that's the beeline into a to attunement and all this stuff. And I realized that she wasn't getting that that was supposed to be happening or that even that it was happening at all. And so um, what I did, usually I would take the baby and I would just like soothe the baby. But this time, instead of soothing the baby, I started um, looking, you know, looking, giving the baby eye to eye contact and taking the top of my head and burying it in the baby's um, belly and then coming back up again and going down and going back up and again. And eventually I got the baby into hysterical laughter. And apparently the baby hadn't laughed before. Really? And yeah, it was just that time. It was just that time of development. But nobody knew to try to make the baby laugh before, you know. And so, um, so the baby's in hysterics. I'm in hysterics. The mother's in hysterics. And for the first time, she actually realized the baby had a, a, a um, the, that the baby was a person because prior to that the way she was responding to that baby was as if it's like a as she put it a blob just a blob that she's wheeling around and dressing and this sort of thing which by the way there's research that teenage mothers respond to who have babies respond to babies that same way as if they're you know it's like a doll they're not really a person um, and so the subjectivity of the baby
was, um, you know, she, it sort of was the birth both of her understanding of the baby's subjectivity, but also of the importance of intersubjectivity. And when we, um, and it was a, a really high point. I mean, it was like one of those amazing moments in therapy that, you know, you cherish forever. But when, as we kept coming back to the, the incident, I'm telling you this story because I believe that the reason this woman, who was very interested in taking good care of her baby, didn't know to look in the eyes of the baby was because her mother never looked in her eyes as a baby. I'm sure that that's the case. And that her body didn't have the implicit memory of being looked at, that eye-to-eye -eye contact. And so that broke the chain I mean, that, that was probably one of the most important places of, um, you know, of attunement, of really tuning into, um, into the baby and breaking that trauma disengagement, um, sort of treating people instrumentally that was going on from generation to generation. And so... That sort of tells you, you know, how it's possible to work with implicit memory that precedes any sort of explicit, um, explicit consciousness or any possibility even of being accessed other than through the body. Does that does that make sense? I guess my question to that story is: Is it? Is, a, is, it, is the converse of that also true, which is that if you don't have that memory, is it possible for there to be an instinct inside you that would try it anyway? That's a, it's, a, it's a good question. If someone, I don't, I think probably not, actually. If you have a mother that doesn't do that eye-to-eye -eye thing, that doesn't try to, you know, that whole incredible... Um, giggly cycle with the with early. I have a feeling it messes with your instinct, your maternal instinct. Yeah. Also, I think it goes a little one step beyond that, almost in a symbolic sense, in, in that this this woman, the mother, has clearly never been seen. Right. Yeah, and abused. So she didn't when when she is being seen, she didn't even realize that that's what being seen looks like. So right. you don't have your end. Yeah. yeah. And you don't even, you know, I imagine that she didn't even realize that that, that you don't, uh, I would imagine that that you, in that situation, you don't realize that something is happening that you're not participating in. Right. Exactly. So you wouldn't know to try, you know, to try it. Anyway. To try it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I think it's a great empirical question, but probably because of so much evidence that early trauma has these devastating effects, um, I'm going to guess not. I'm, I really think it takes inner subjectivity to understand inner subjectivity. Now, it can take it later in life, you know, so once she got it, she was on it, you know, she, uh, she totally, that the, the, the blob became a, you know, living, wonderful creature. Um, but... I, I think it'd be hard to stumble upon it without having the experience of it. That's the sort of the beauty and the scary piece of relation of, the, of, of interpersonal neurobiology, really. Well, I guess I guess what I'm curious about is, is innovation then for those for those people who don't fit into the normal pockets. Mm -hmm. If there isn't that kind of a normal interaction, how does one go? Mm -hmm outside of that to innovate okay. or go outside of that to be sure. atypical. Now remember, we're talking about super, super early. We're talking about the first three, month, three months of life. Mm -hmm. And so I think that maybe the kind of um, atypical outlier type stuff you're talking about comes is coming later. Mm -hmm. And the later it is, the less it's um, compromised by these processes. Okay. Yeah, so sure, down the line, um, there's all sorts of incredible stories about being able to compensate for things or, you know, um, go, go around various things. But 
not, this is why Alan Shore hates the concept of resilience as applied to early infancy, because it just doesn't exist. If you don't get in the first three months um, and in the womb, if you don't get what you need, um, you know, this is where the whole Romanian institutionalized babies yeah. wind up dead. I mean, you just, they, or uh, radical attachment disorder. Someone goes and gets one of these babies and brings it back and just pours love, et cetera, et cetera. If it's past that um, original uh, time frame, it is extremely hard to reverse. Mm -hmm. Extremely hard. Now, if the trauma comes later, it's much easier to work with it. That's the whole thing about when does the trauma come. The earlier it is, the more it's irreversible. Um, and the more it's, it's the deep subcortical structures of the brain, not just um, the higher stuff. It plays with adoption too, right? That, that, that there's just a lot of reports about adopting within six months. Mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. whatever. I don't know, I've seen different, right. different dates on that, but once you move beyond a certain uh, date, uh, it, it makes it much harder for right. the development and the, atta and the, and the attachment, attachment to the new yeah. parent. And yeah, then. and with, with adoption, you've got two different things going. One is the if there's trauma during that first um, few months, um, you've got that. But then you also have this, this thing about um, attuning to someone that has a whole different sort of um, internal chemistry. <coughs> Uh, going and and that piece even if you adopt early but if there's not a fit you're going to get this out of sync kind of thing we were talking about earlier um, so there, there's just a greater chance statistically because of the genetic differences that it won't be um, it won't be a fit and if you get a super sensitive baby and a not so sensitive mother then it's there's a problem even if there wasn't trauma so have you thought any other thoughts about that stuff and the implicit implicit memory and I was just thinking about and I can't remember his name but a boy called it who was at one time the worst yeah, you know you what I'm talking about the worst at least the worst reported case in the state of California of child abuse mm -hmm. but when he was an infant Everything was fine. Something happened to the mother. She had a psychotic break or something, and she became extremely abusive. And then the father was very passive. But he had a mentor. He went through all the foster system and everything, and just went through the most profound abuse that you can believe. But he found a mentor, and now he's written his books. He's a father. He speaks about this, and he's come around. Wow. But he had the initial, it was a tune at that age, mm -hmm. the infancy. It was after that that it started to go awry. Mm -hmm. It just speaks to that mm -hmm. whole piece. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really does. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of uh, the story. There's a there's a, an artist named uh, Bijali who, and she's written about this, so I, I don't think this uh, there's any confidentiality thing, um, who, whose mother was schizophrenic, and I guess when she was about age three or so, the mother would put her in a cage um, to kind of deal with her. I don't think the mother was purposefully trying to be abusive, but she was schizophrenic. And um, similarly, she had enough of a, an early childhood background so that um, she's now this incredible artist who doesn't, you, you might call her homeless in a sense because she doesn't have a home, she's never had a home, but she goes all over the world and she makes art in communities and in indigenous communities and makes art into like the mountains and stuff and, and all this stuff happens where springs come up and you know it's sort of magical um, magical things so she's adapted to you know a cageless uh, not being caged in in a very creative way and I think we were talking about relationship between schizophrenia and creativity and this sort of thing and so the line between pathology and adaptation a really creative adaptation is such a thin one um, everywhere so but 
again, just underscoring this point, if the, if, if the baby doesn't get it in the first three months, um, it's really not reversible. It's really not reversible. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's implicit and explicit. And you guys, we've done long-term and short-term and semantic and episodic. Okay, let me, let me, you probably didn't do this one. So, um, the, the, again, the sort of the tradition of how to label the different kinds of memory, different kinds of memories goes back and then the tradition winds up kind of really um, shaping how we think about these concepts. Um, and there's a new guy um, with, a, with a sort of a different way of, of labeling memory, and I'll tell you about, um, about that because I think that's kind of interesting. Um, and his way, his most basic distinction is between generic memory and singular memory. Um, and, gener and so generic memory is memory for patterns. Um, and so, and underneath memory for patterns are um, either procedural, so body-based, and generic semantic. So, so words, for example, like just knowing what a word is, is a form of memory. We don't think about it like that, but it is, it's just knowing the words for things. And, and that's a, a generic kind of memory in the sense that when, it, when a child first encounters a dog and learns the word dog, the word, the learning and the memory is tied to the episode at the, in the beginning. But then the, the, the kid goes around and, and eventually encounters a whole bunch of different dogs and suddenly you don't need any dog to be there to have that memory. And so that's, um, that's a generic semantic kind of, of, um, of memory. And so it requires exposures through multiple contexts. Anything that has that kind of um, multiple context and then gets removed abstractly from the context would be a generic kind of memory. Um, and that kind of memory becomes independent of subcortical structures. So if somebody gets brain damaged or gets uh, you know um, old and winds up having deterioration, that kind of memory that's that does not use the subcortical structures um, is going to be the last to go, among the last to go. Does that make sense? Um, and that's, verse, that's versus singular memory. And so um, singular, and because, and that's stored, it's stored in a distributed way in, in the cortical structures of the brain. So singular memory is either episodic, and so any, you know, the, just us remembering what happens in our lives would be a form of singular memory, but so would singular facts, like Paris is the, is the capital of France. Um, so there's only one, one fact. So history, for example, and with me, I was saying I have a terrible memory for what happens in my life. I also have a terrible, te horrible memory for history. And now I know why if those two are this similar because they're, it's the same kind of memory. It's the singular fact type of memory. Um, and so, um, and basically, as we we're saying, all knowledge and learning requires memory. And, um, and the importance of it is prospective and it depends on the frequency. So if we keep encountering something, there's a better likelihood it'll go from being singular to being this generic kind of memory that we won't, um, we won't give up. So the singular memories can become generic memories? Some of them can. Um, but yeah, they can. If you, if you keep encountering, like Paris is the um, capital of France. If you just like read that once when you're a kid, that's going to be a singular memory that never gets generic. But let's say you live in Paris and you, you know, and you keep encountering Paris from all different contexts, um, then it's going to become, you know, then it'll become more like a generic memory. Um, even that fact, I think, will become a generic memory that would be hard to forget. 
I don't know if any research has been done about that sort of factual memory becoming generic, but in general, that's the case. Um, let's talk, let me see where we are. Hey, yeah. Can I ask, what about the, the memory that's been linked to imagination and projecting the future? Yeah, okay. This is my favorite topic, actually. Yeah. I'm about to, I am about to write a paper on this topic with Yacht Pengsa. So that, all right, so let's go to the hippocampus then. Because uh, I think, let's just sort of go to the structures under underneath it. Um, so the hippocampus is the part of the brain that is um, historically thought of for episodic memory, right? And, and if you look at the hippocampus, you look at like the, um, cell structure of it compared to, say, the cortical structure of the visual, say, the, the visual system. The visual system is very hierarchical and it's very ordered. Um, and it's there's feature extraction and all this stuff. And, the, and so, um, and the purpose of that is to extract invariant features from the environment. Um, so, in other words, Whoever, if you've taken LSD, um, all of a sudden your visual system no longer extracts invariant features. You've got this moving environment, right? And and, and, um, and it looks, it doesn't stay still. But under ordinary conditions, where our brains are built to have order, have the background visual environment be highly ordered. And so that part of the brain, um, I noticed somebody had a, and you, you have a thing with, uh, yeah, so that inspired me to talk about LSD about this. Um, and so, so the, the, very, the, the sort of hierarchical cortical um, arrangement of the, of the visual system is, to, is for that kind of static, still feature, invariant feature extraction. So if you go to the hippocampus and you look at this, how it's structured, it's more like a random access memory in your computer than this very highly ordered thing. And that's because when we have, it's, it's kind of designed to be idiosyncratic. Each one of us has very idiosyncratic experience, very idiosyncratic memories. And so it's designed to be able to record um, that, you know, what's unique and what's uh, idiosyncratic. So they used to think that um, the hippocampus was just for memory, but it turns out that, um, all right, I'm going to tell a hippocampus story that gets to what you're talking about, um, that if um, the other thing the hippocampus does, that, that the researchers who look at rat hippocampus um, study rat navigation in physical space. So the hippocampus is actually um, at more primitive levels um, how we navigate physically in the world. The taxi drivers in London. Yeah, like the taxi car. The, the, the cab taxi drivers in London. Have, have um, more, Spatial. have advanced, have larger hippocampuses. Um, because they know all the streets um, and such. Wow. And yeah, and anything else you know a lot about can, tends to expand um, areas of the hippocampus. Um, and so there was sort of like, well, what does navigation have to do with memory? But then there's also the really interesting thing that in the ancient Greek times, um, that one of those mnemonic devices would be to picture like a room, a house, and then put the facts in different parts of the house. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that orators would remember long speeches is by walking through the house. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you can see how the spatial, the spatial navigation thing does bear some relationship mm -hmm. to personal memory. Um, but the most recent thing is what you're talking about, the fact that um, imagination, as well as future projection, is a function of the hippocampus. So the paper that I want, and, and, there, and the question is, how does that work? 
And that really changes, um, a, that really changes what memory is all about. So I'll, I'll tell you first um, what I, what my work with that um, has, is, is, is all about. And then I'll go to the um, uh, memory reconsolidation, which you talked about a little bit, I think, earlier today. Or not? Okay. Well, we'll talk. We'll talk about that, and I'll, and I'll give a couple of, of cases. So, um, all the because the, the the researchers, brain researchers, tend to be very focused on their little labs and their little experiments, and often their little experiments are very sort of arbitrary, and they're using fMRIs um, and uh, you know things that are not ecologically very valid. It's easy to come up with conclusions that don't make a lot of sense when you look at it from other points of view. And so there's this um, debate in the literature of what does it mean that the hippocampus is um, both the source of episodic memory, spatial navigation, uh, imagination that's atemporal, meaning you can imagine worlds that don't exist in real time, and future projection, like I'm going to a party tonight, um, and so I can imagine what's what that's like. So let me let me bring put this to you guys. How do you put that all together? Um, is there do you have any sort of intuition about what that means? I mean, how it all goes together and why it goes together? I think we're pattern seeking creatures. Mm -hmm. And okay. that we can extrapolate from the patterns that we do know to imagine patterns that we can get to account. Certainly that's true. Mm -hmm. Certainly that's true. And then ex experience allows us to draw from that to place ourselves within the potential of that experience moving forward ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I've felt it once before on any level, then I can envision feeling it moving ahead. And if I've felt a dozen different things, then I can combine some elements of those dozen different things to imagine something that I've never experienced. Mm -hmm. That's one of the that's one of the main theories that's been put out is that there's this recombinant recombinatory effect of past going into the future. The other main um, uh, hypothesis about how those things go together is called scene construction. Um, and that scene, S-C-E-N-E, scene construction, that, that, that the function of the hippocampus is scene construction, that because for all those things, for um, to to imagine the future or to imagine some atemporal thing, you need a scene. You need a like a, a spatial, a visual spatial scene into which it goes. I look at that um, idea, or even the abstract idea that you're saying, and um, and think this is too cognitive. It's too heady, um, it doesn't, it's missing the body. And so um, my theory about how those things go together is that um, the precursor to the human level, the, the sort of in the rat or in the, um, in the mammals is spatial navigation. I think what the hippocampus is doing in humans is social navigation. And that part of social navigation is both imagining future events, finding patterns, um, constructing scenes, but the um, navigation is body-based. You know, the idea of navigation as opposed to scene construction, which is a very disembodied um, notion, or even having to break up past events and recombine them, it's a very, that's also sort of a mechanistic linear way of um, looking at imagination as opposed to a more nonlinear emergent function that novelty is a is a um, emergent function of, of new experiences um, in the, you know with the totality of, of things so um, kind of more like a 3d version versus a 2d version yes and this thing that's so cool about it, it's actually probably more like a 
4D, 4D version. Whatever. Right. It's more like a 4D version. And I just was contacted. I was really excited to come today because I was just contacted by somebody who is looking at quaternions, which are four-dimensional fractals, and yet uh, and wondering how they relate to melody and tone. Um, and but but I had uh, said that they might relate to consciousness, to how consciousness works. And so, all right, let me see if I can describe this. The dimensionality piece is very cool, and with rats. They, they're, they've been able, this guy named Busaki, who's a nonlinear researcher, is able to look at two stages of rat navigation. So in the first stage, the rat like explores the environment through straight lines. So say a, a rat is like moving through and feeling the environment as it goes with its body. And as it does that, it's calibrating sensory motor functions. So you see, see what I'm saying? So it, as it, it um, what it sees, what it feels, what it smells, everything gets calibrated so that originally it has to move through the environment by touch. And that's um, like a dead reckoning of sailors that keep track of where they're going as they go. But then once that happens and once everything is calibrated, then the rat is able to use external signals to see where it is. So the sight of a water dish or something like that, it can incorporate that and, and, um, and work from the outside in. So it has to work from the inside out, gets grounded, gets oriented, and then is able to navigate from the outside in. I, th I think that children do the same thing through imaginary play. And so the other thing is that the rat has to explore the same point from multiple points in order to get oriented. And when it gets oriented, it goes from 1D lines to a two-dimensional, the play cells in the hippocampus go to a two-dimensional map. And, that's, and, and it's oriented. So I think that children have that same process where in imaginary play, they're approaching, you know, they play doctors and they play their, their, their first they're the doctor, then they're the sick one or the ambulance driver or they're, you know, they explore the same places from these multiple um, angles and, um, and then internalize this, this and are able to um, then have, a, have an intuition, a grounded intuition that lets them navigate social space intuitively. It's, Does that make sense? It feels like you could overlay the Jones work with dream work on top of this in that he starts from the, from the application perspective, he starts with the personal perspective and the cultural perspective than the archetypal perspective mm -hmm. and then the psychoid perspective. Like you could literally mm -hmm. take each one of those. Right, each is embedded in the next. And lay them in, you You're know, right. That's that and that's, and it's a fractal <laughs> model. <laughs> exactly. It's a, and yeah, and I've, I've actually written about a frat in, I have a paper that, of all the papers I've written, this one's the most cited, called The Self is a Dynamical System. And it, it looks at the self, you know, in, personal, cultural, etc. as a fractal, there, there, there's a fractal embedding in it. So yeah, I, I think you're right. And then the dimensionality in, increases mm -hmm. with each um, layer. layer. Yeah. yeah. So how to model that is um, a very interesting question. You know, how to actually use the fractals and stuff to model it is, seems to me the question that's coming up now that's um, just really, really interests me. Um, so, okay, so, okay, so I think let's go to memory reconsolidation since we talked about the hippocampus. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, I'm, you, you really got a sort of state of the art. Uh, um, yeah, well, it's very interesting to me and part of my, um, you know, part of the research that um, it's the oh. I guess, scientific part of scientific. Um, natural science part of um, the more um, depth approach to what I'm researching. So I'm very interested in, in the way that works. And also personal memories, actual personal memories, what I did versus 
um, um, memories of experience. I didn't act actually do it myself, but I witnessed it happen. I'm watching it. I'm experiencing it in a mm. cultural sense. Uh -huh. And how that can then help um, uh, imagine uh, or help reframe, I guess, on some sense, the potential for the future for someone who mm -hmm. might be, let's say, depressed and, and can't imagine or just has self-doubt and can't imagine moving forward, can't imagine succeeding. And being able to use memories, both both personal, cultural, and collective mm -hmm. memories, to help move um, out of that stuckness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk. A couple pieces relevant to that: state-dependent memory. Um, you know what that is? Uh, state-dependent memory is the idea that um, what we remember depends on what, especially either what our emotional state is or our altered state or whatever, so that if this whole thing, like if you're drunk and you lose your keys and you want to find them, don't look for them when you're not drunk. Get drunk again and look for them. Um, oh, that's a great <laughs> <laughs> uh, Because memory is completely state dependent. And um, which means that if someone is depressed and is exposed to someone who's not depressed, they're not really going to take that in. Because when someone's de depressed, what they have access to in themselves are all the bad things that, that emotion is. Okay, so the amygdala, let's go back to the structures underneath, got the hippocampus being the, the seat of uh, episodic memory, but the amygdala is the structure that helps us remember emotionally salient um, events. And really, um, uh, memory is guided by how emotionally powerful something is. And so fearful memories and this sort of thing, like the amygdala pops with strong emotion, positive or negative, but especially negative. And so um, negative emotion is incredibly powerful um, in terms of what we have access to in, in memory, which is why Beck's whole triad about the past, the present, and the future, that you know you, you have access to, to all the, the horrible things that happened in the past when you're really depressed, the, the present feels very... Um, horrible, and all you can see is a uh, is a terrible future ahead. Um, and if you're exposed to somebody else who has a totally different experience, it's actually not going to help you very much um, because of that. In in terms of uh, you know the memory, if there's more emotional resonance, um, then it could. And the other piece that I'm thinking is relevant to what you're talking about would be mirror neurons, mm -hmm. um, which also have that emotional contagion piece to it. Um, they're, you know, the mirror neurons are um, definitely involved with the um, emotional contagion part of empathy and, and, and affect resonance. But you've got to have you've got to have some resonance to begin with for it to stick. Otherwise, it's definitely not going to stick at all. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's interesting because I'm sitting over here thinking about like the, uh, the the colloquial expression "misery loves company." Right. And I think about how we know things before we actually really know them, and that the neuroscience is just really catching up to. A lot of that. Right. So there are two pieces to that. I think one is this um, the, the mirror neuron thing. The catch with the mirror neuron thing is that um, the more you have to actually have the thing in you that you see for it to resonate with you. So um, the more, like, the, so the things like um, I'm reaching for a cup. And you watch me do that, and your body knows what I'm doing because your body's done that a zillion times. And so you not only um, resonate, your mirror neurons resonate with me reaching for the cup, 
but you know my intention. Like, you know whether I'm going to be drinking out of that cup or putting the cup in the dishwasher or putting or throwing that cup away or whatever. Um, and so that's kind of the mind reading piece of, of the mirror neurons. But when it comes to stuff that you've never done before, if your body doesn't know it, your mirror neurons don't, they don't go off. And so the more expert we are at something, the more we actually practice it when we see someone else do it, which, which actually is why I believe that this whole thing about uh, violent video games, for example, um, and whether they have any relationship to uh, actual violence in the world. For somebody who's not violent, um, for, for a kid who has no intention of being violent, they can play those games and there's no relationship with action and, and their action in the world. But somebody who's on a violent course who actually is violent is practicing. Their mirror neurons are just going crazy. They're practicing being violent by doing those games. And so there's a, um, I don't know if there's specific research on this, but there should be because there'd be a real bivalent um, connection um, between the games for kids who are, or people who are or aren't violent, if that makes sense. So that also I think has relevance to mm -hmm. what you're talking about. It's whether, you know, the more resonance somebody has with something, the more other people's experience can inform our own and become part of our own memory. The less resonance there are, there is, then the, the less that's going to happen. But that brings me to yet another kind of memory, which is um, like genetic memory. And I think that fits, that would fit with both Hume's notion of archetypal memory, um, but there's also a kind of, we do have a kind of genetic memory as well, um, like uh, fear, of, fear of snakes, mm -hmm. fear of spiders, mm -hmm. fear of falling. Um, all of that is part of a, a genetic kind of memory that probably shades right into Jung's archetypes. So, yeah. This is the same examples for um, the collective unconscious mm -hmm. and those automatic instinctual responses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the primates have a fear of snakes as well. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> Except other snakes. I like snakes. Mm -hmm. I like and I like to hold snakes too. Um, the amygdala is seems to be the seat. <laughs> the the amygdala is the seat of that those kinds of fears as well as uh, prejudice and this sort of thing. When you mention prejudice, I think of um, the researchers in the UK, Crisp, in that group, and they've been doing research around the imagination and the capacity to imagine to reduce prejudice. Uh -huh. And so it's it's the same type of conversation about the scene uh -huh. and the imaginal scene, and then um, to notice the differences in biases and uh -huh. assumptions and violent thinking and things like that. Oh, interesting. And then another one in Italy doing stuff around forgiveness mm -hmm. and the capacity to imagine, mm -hmm. to expand the perception which goes along with empathy. Right. So I love this. Stuff. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. And there, you know, there are um, <coughs> implicit biases. This is such a hot research area is implicit bias. Have you guys tried this online? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's fascinating. Okay, so you should look it up. I, I can't give you the site, but I'm, it'll be easy to find it. Where, um, so if somebody says to you, are you prejudiced against fat people? You're probably going to say yes. no. Well, you'll say yes if you're honest. You'll say yes if you're honest. But if you're trying to be politically correct, you'll probably say no, right? Um, but uh, your body, um, and this actually goes right back to Hume's association test, actually. Mm -hmm. um, your, your body, everybody's body Alive. is prejudiced against fat people. And the way that... Um, this is tested if you find one, if you go to one of these, macro, what's that? The macro uh, expressions? Um, no, it's not. It, it, it's uh, reaction time. 
Uh-huh. And that's oh. and that that's why yeah. I'm linking it to Freud's associ- original association test. Yeah. Is it? Uh, huh? No. Young. I'm Jung, I'm sorry, Jung's, Jung's association test, because the, the delay in, rea- in reaction time, time around time, yeah. conflictual uh, subjects. You've got to stop and filter your answer. And exactly. And so implicit bias is measured by people pairing um, uh, good and fat and good and skinny, the difference in, the, in this. Um, there's a longer reaction. It's harder to pair good and fat for pretty pretty much everybody um, with than good and skinny and what skinny. Do you mean pairing? What do you mean by pairing? The the words. When you associate in the test you get two words. Uh-huh. Putting them together. It's so easier pair to, association. Uh-huh. to it's respond easier to, to that. Effect. So when so you know to, to your reaction that. time. Yeah, your reaction time when those two words are together. It's it's a longer reaction time than the the easier one to the the one that you're prejudiced toward. So right. yeah, all this yeah. So you can take the test and see how you know. And and I think there are various forms of it and that of different kinds of pairings and stuff. And it's called implicit bias. It's called implicit bias. Yeah, and it's 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 a it's a very hot area of, of study and it's like you know we have two sides and that implicit side is our is really where the unconscious lives mm-hmm. and it's in the body it's not in in the conscious brain it's in you know it's really in the body which is an interesting statement which like immediately like conjures the, the idea of where does soul live within the body mm-hmm. whether the soul's in the body at all yeah or 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 is it you know, in is the it body? Is it in the brain? Is it in the heart? Is it like everywhere? Where, where do you think? Where do things live? Yeah. yeah. Where do you think it lives? Uh, I I think it's it's atemporal in the sense that it, it can be in many places at the same mm-hmm. time, like electrons, you know, mm-hmm. that uh, they skip a beat and they're sort of somewhere else at the same time. Or maybe it's fractal. Um, which would mean it's both imminent and and with what is imminent and transcendent. Yeah, because a fractal pattern is both in each scale, but it's also independent of each scale. So it's kind of in it's both finitely expressed and infinitely um, present too. That'd be a good paper. Like the soul is fractal. <laughs> oh, I like that idea. Uh, that's a good question, though, and that's not a question. It's not only a question a union would ask. Uh, would ask, I think, a certain a psycho a psychoanalyst. I don't. I don't think they talk about the soul. Um, yeah, unions don't. Unions don't have a problem. They, right. They just, might, they just might call it something a little different. Right. You know? But I, I definitely, I definitely think it would be in the body for sure, along with the unconscious. Because don't you think animals have souls? Um, I mean, I know the Catholic Catholics don't, but um, well, they do now. Pope, Pope recently said yeah, that animals are going to happen. Oh, he did. He the dogs going to happen. Okay, so he's he but he's radical. radical. Frank is very this, progressive. This this is the first really one. Is. Yeah, this right. is the first one that's, <laughs> that's radical in yeah. this way. Yeah, he's 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 a rebel. He's a he's rebel. A rebel. Oh, yeah. Gay gays and divorcees and stuff. It's really uh, yeah. It's like political move too because they need they need uh, they need the funds. <laughs> right. Although he said recently that it's selfish not to help. Oh yeah. So so um. Here's a, here's a topic I think is kind of interesting that maybe is a good way to sort of close out um, this, is in contrast to memory, where we talk about holding on to things and having access to things that we want to hold on to, let's talk about forgetting and the importance of forgetting. Um, and let's talk about uh, psycho psychopathology and either remembering or forgetting. Let's like look at psychopathology through the lens of memory and forgetting. But starting with forgetting, um, is forgetting important? Yes. yes. Okay, why? <laughs> because otherwise it's hard to move on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
there's only so much storage space and you've got to clean out your closet of the old clothes <laughs> before you can buy new ones. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Unless you keep buying bigger Unless bigger houses. <laughs> Eternal Sunshine. Exactly. Sunshine. Wasn't that a wonderful movie? Yeah. yeah. It was. So part of the reason he's getting involved in this organization, he really resonates with a lot of this. It does feel Yeah, he does. I think, yeah. I won't speculate too much about that. I, already, I think I've already got myself into a little trouble with yeah. But I think um, also understanding what, uh, where you forget and where you remember is, is valuable. Not just the idea of forgetting right. and of, of remembering, right. but understanding where the distinction is personal. Right, what you want to, yeah, because what, what forgetting everything yeah. is no good. Yeah, and the things, you know, they're, they're, I'm, I imagine that there are patterns in the type of things that one remembers and one forgets versus somebody else and, and how that oh, sure. is personally attuned. Right. I would I would guess that one's very sense of self and one's sense of other people's self would relate to that pattern pretty profoundly. Mm -hmm. um, but how can you grow without forgetting? How can you grow without forgetting? Yeah. It's true. I mean, there's a condition called hyper hypernesia. Which is people who remember everything, <laughs> um, and there are different forms of it. It's a very rare. It's it's rare in what there are like only seven people in the world or something who remember every day of their life. Um, so there is an episodic memory, but there's also um, savant syndrome, where people um, remember little. Um, pockets of information, like every baseball statistic that ever were was, is one kind of example where they, you know, they get very interested in a narrow corridor of experience and then have this incredible memory for it. Um, so I, I totally agree that sort of what you're remembering, what you're forgetting, is going to be very um, particular to the person and very connected to who we are and who we sense other people as being. Um, but but this idea of absolutely needing to forget in order to clean the slate is, is really very, very important and profound. And one of the places that that is so evident is in, um, uh, let's say, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, is, is an example that where um, what people ha people essentially have a sort of sticky left brain, um, and there's and there that's actually a phrase this sticky left brain that they get into stuck these obsessive in yeah they get stuck in these loops in these thought loops that goes round and round and round and it's as if they're not it's as if they're not remembering that they turned off the stove or that the memory of that doesn't. Um, you know, doesn't doesn't sort of get fully embodied in a way that lets them let go, and um, so that's you know really connected. The sort of sticky memory and sticky left brain is connected to a lack of self trust and a difficulty living with uncertainty. I mean, there's a lot of um, affective um, problems yeah. underneath it, but it does it is like uh, trying to hold something in working memory over and over again in a way that's clearly pathological. PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, is an example of memory intrusion. Um, and in the case of that kind of traumatic memory, that is, um, that it's often, um, so, so trauma tends to fragment memory. And it also, it, it tends to fragment the co cohesiveness, the coherence of different memories. And so um, a person that's been in the battleground will have very strong sensory, you know, pockets of different sensory memories or flashbulb memories. A flashbulb memory would be if you have, if there's a really intense event and then that 
the actual sensory experience of that event gets gets um, burned into into uh, your um, experience and then keeps intruding over and over again. And because um, that's such a problem in, in PTSD, we've a lot of uh, therapists have been misguided to think that the best way of dealing with somebody who's been in a trauma is to talk about it right away. And um, but what that can do is, enforce the memory of the experience, reinforce the memory of the experience in a way that's not necessarily helpful. And so it's really important, um, and there's greater sensitivity now to that issue um, of whether or, not when, whether or not and when it's a good idea to be talking about these traumatic experiences. Um, if that makes sense, okay. So this, um, this thing about hypermnesia, which I, I really find very, very interesting um, because going back to genetic memory, it's another place where genetic memory appears to be the case is in savant syndrome, um, where the, you can have a child who's never been exposed to an art, you know, to an art or to music or, or um, something like that, know the rules of music out the box. Yeah, Jennifer Lynn. I was just watching something that she did at the age of 12. She, you, could, you could give her five different random letters from the scale, and she could create an entire, like on the spot, an entire score. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're like, uh, right. Like, exactly. You know, like, exactly. I worked with a little autistic boy who was a salon, and by the age of one, he taught himself to read. He spoke five languages and you would put him in front of a piano and he would just start like beautifully playing this music and just amazing and yet socially it was hard for him to um always relate with other people but he's gotten so much better because of community therapy and all the work that we did with him but yeah he just it was amazing his abilities Right, and so that appears to be a kind of genetic, these arts, and it turns out that this, this autistic, whether it's autistic or some other disability, cognitive disability, um, there's gift. a... Hmm? Important gift. Well, the, there's the cop, there is a definite cognitive disability piece to it, and yes. then there's this gift that's connected to it, and mm -hmm. how that connection works is a really interesting question. It appears that um, sometimes the disability is exactly what makes the gift possible. Um, and, and so the question then becomes if that's part of, these things are part of genetic memory. And by the way, the, the savant syndrome um, sometimes happens, there's an acquired savant syndrome. So sometimes people that have brain damage mm -hmm. from accidents or from disease or tumors or that sort of thing actually acquire um, these skills later in life and suddenly, um, and that, which is really interesting too. And so it seems to imply that we all have this genetic memory. It's in, for yeah. Yeah. And, and, that, um, and now I'm thinking after I've now um, sort of added the cerebellum to my little brain structures of interest in this respect, that this actually may be uh, encoded in the cerebellum, which, um, which, is, which is, connect, is connected to the origins of language. It's connected to um, just how our bodies have developed rules for sequences of motions and this sort of thing. And so the arts, so savants that like with the autistic boy, um, they fall into the same category all over the world. The same sort of five basic categories of being either lightning calculators, like people who, where you say, can he do that too? Yeah. Where you say like, um, what day of the week was November 3rd, 1940? And they, and they, you know, can tell you that. Um, so that, yeah, and it's like incredible. So that, and that Rain Man was that kind of, of um, thing, you know. And so um, that kind of calculation 
um, is one type. Um, the uh, musical is another type. Um, language, uh, art. The, 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 this guy, Stephen, I forget his last name, who is an African-American British guy who, can, who goes up in a helicopter and over a city for 10 minutes and then draws every building in the city. It's like incredible, um, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm, so. I'm, sorry, I'm curious because I've worked with three children like this. Really? On the spectrum uh -huh. who have been ridiculous, like savant like. Right. And then they had autism and they were, you know, diagnosed and they got all the yeah. services because of their social mobility. But if you looked in their family history, uncles, aunts, parents, they were all geniuses themselves. Yeah. There was just way mm -hmm. too much. They were just so much, so smart, so just smart yeah, that they couldn't then function, you know, where the parents were able to. Um, but, right. you know, yeah. they themselves, I guess, in our generation, I want to say it's more. Yeah, I think um, it, well, it's an open question. Right. It's an open inability. The way, you know. Well, there's something about. So you're saying that the parents were just as talented? Yeah, as, and they yeah. were and if you they were fine. Them, they're just as awkward as that child. And they, they, if some of the stuff they have, they don't have the ability to. It's like they won't be able to meet the eye and have a conversation with me. But they weren't diagnosed because they were a little bit higher functioning from their ability to, you know, right. make connections. With right. People. Plus, in the past, a lot of people that would have been diagnosed as autistic or not because we didn't have that diagnosis and it wasn't socially, you know, it wasn't the social thing. I mean, that diagnosis, it's so, it's overdose diagnosed uh, kind of thing to be put on the spectrum. So, um, yeah, I think that there's, there's clearly a genetic um, inheritance piece to, to it. And then there may be this kind of genetic memory that can get unleashed when other parts of the brain aren't um, distracting us from this these deeper connections which which would explain more the um, acquired savant issue you know of somebody suddenly having brain damage and then discovering their artistic skill or other forms of um, or what about if you were to take that last comment you made and put it within the context of meditation or like absolutely you know, sure you know you talk about like um, you know, a, a, a yogi, for example, who can mm -hmm. go all the way to the right brain and mm -hmm. just completely mm -hmm. do connect with stuff right. that we just can't do. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that the more, you know, for myself, I was telling you when I started dancing how awkward and weird and I was hitting people and going the wrong way and all this stuff and, and how I've been really, really working on that and can feel... Um, I can feel the shifts in, in that capacity, and now I can feel how uh, the level of nuance that I'm attending to is it's at a whole different level, and it, combined with the, the yoga stuff, um, and then patterns of synchronicity come, I mean, I think, you know, I think there's no end to when you get the words out of the way and you get the clutter out of the way. Um, the kind of interconnectedness and then outer connectedness that's possible is limitless, I think. So yeah, I, I, I think I, I think words and consciousness are really overrated uh, in terms of uh, life and um, the whole the whole bit. Um, we could end there, or I could do memory reconsolidation. Let me do re memory reconsolidation really quickly, I think, because. It's, it's, it's kind of an important cap um, to what we're talking about. So um, the idea that the, um, I started out by talking about how memory really is nonlinear in nature. And one of the major way, and, and so part of what that means is that um, as we're talking about memory is really to navigate into the future, is that past, present, and future are not some line um, but there, it's all intermingled. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, how memory works, uh, if you every time we recall something, a memory, 
then um, it'll it, just like with the rabbits that are that I was talking about. Every time we recall it in a different context, it changes, yeah. and it needs to, and then it gets reconsolidated right. in this different and it's form. Permanently altered. And it's permanently altered. It's rewritten like a. It's rewritten. Yeah. And is that that's true with facts as well as events? Um, it's true for everything. And I think that the I think that the um, Freeman's work, you know, with just the smell thing, uh, sh shows it at this very deep physiological single cell level. Yeah. Ask that question earlier about if someone did about the olfactory and why that seems well, to be the most old, right, the most acute sense. Of oh yeah, so it fits it fits with smell. Um, we can reconsolidate, but it's so it's such a it's so essentially. Um, there's a, a paper coming out in behavioral and brain uh, sciences that is making by a guy named Lane making the claim that all of therapy, the mechanism of therapy across the board, is memory reconsolidation, um, and which uh, totally makes sense. I, I have a commentary in that issue, by the way, with Yah Pinsap, um, which is kind of cool because it's a really technical. Um, journal, but um, it, it does make sense, and I think it's true, but what but what's dangerous about viewing therapy that way, and so, you know, what we're essentially doing, if you, if you think about it, if somebody has a traumatic history, and then they talk about it with you in therapy in such a way that they feel altered, then the, the, the memory becomes permanently altered. It's easy to see in the case of trauma, because they go from, you know, this, like, flashbulb thing where uh, they're out in the street and if the car backfires they're back in Vietnam kind of thing to being able to talk about the experience of being in Vietnam without having that you know body-based sensory overload connected to it that's an obvious example um, but there are um, there are many um, uh, other examples of it but the thing a couple things about that so um, what it means, though, is that there's a chemical process that allows that reconsolidation to occur, and there are some people working on drugs to prevent mm -hmm. reconsolidation to help with traumatic memory, which goes back to the you know sunshine of the spotless mind kind of idea that we can that we can actually be helped to forget things. Um, I don't know if it's actually if it's going to go quite that far. Is that the study with the adrenaline that shoots in and sort of solidifies our our experiences, and that okay. without that, it'll be it there'll be a different a forget that you're not reconsolidating it in a, in a way. That's, that's a good example of yeah, adrenaline certainly um, is intensifies memories of of a certain kind, and then if you can remember without adrenaline being present, you're gonna it's gonna reconsolidate in a different way. It's not that you're gonna forget it, but it's yeah, going so to you're gonna have a, a different form of reconsolidation. That's a, a very good example of that's easily. Um, is easily understood. I'll give you, um, uh, I'll, let's go out with a, a case example that, um, because I think if you really, you know, if, if you look at um, doing long-term work with people, you can find where this is happening with them. But here's a, here's a really good example of it. I worked with a guy who had um, been in the desert um, in a hotel at the top floor of a hotel when there was a, an earthquake. And um, he, and, and it was dark, and he scrambled to get out. He wound up like following other people out, but he, he got into a real panic about um, not being able to get out. And so over time, he had a, a kind of what's called a simple trauma because at least in his mind, before he, he sort of separated his life into before the earthquake and after. And before the earthquake, he would say his life was was fine, no problems, normal childhood, etc. And then after, he slowly his life got smaller and smaller and smaller, um, and to where he didn't want to leave his house, or if he did leave his house, he would like plan for I'm going here, so I need this and I'm this, and, you know, and just like this very elaborate, fearful, constricted kind of um, existence. 
And he, um, and this was probably several years after he, this, this event that he came for therapy. And he was really, I think, coming for therapy because his daughter was reaching um, adolescence and needed to be going out in the world. And I think he instinctively knew that he was, his own fearfulness was not a good influence in the kind of way you're talking about on, on her capacity to grow. So when I did, um, when I worked with him, we wound up using the earthquake as a, as a metaphor. And, um, and I kind of did an earthquake on him by helping him shift from thinking he was afraid of what was in the outside environment to afraid of himself and what was inside and that there really is no safety outside at all. Um, and if this worked for him um, and he, you know, he slowly realized that uh, this was all internal, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of this memory reconsolidation thing, once he was um, on his way to feeling more comfortable and safe in the world and, you know, and, and able to go out, when we returned to the original memory of the earthquake, he saw in he saw the exit sign that had been there all along with the stairwell down, and so um, it actually he actually had a different memory of the original event, and and that sort of shows you the kind of um, opening up of dimensionality. You know that that sign was there all along, but he was too afraid to see it in his mind's eye, and then could see it. Looking back, did you did you actually finish your thought on re, with regards to your commentary on the danger of? Oh, I didn't you? finish that thought on the, on the danger of it. Yeah, what I think is the danger of it is that um, that view of therapy is a mechanistic, non-relational view because the in order to have memory reconsolidation, you have to have a safe relationship. And so um, either that or you have some kind of good drug, but I don't think I believe in the drug thing. And I try to get people off drugs. So, um, yeah, so I think that's a, it, it, it actually is a very dangerous, it, it's reductionistic, exactly. So even though it's true, it's like a byproduct of good therapy, not the mechanism by which it happens. And that's very similar to like in yoga, where maybe the good body is the byproduct of doing yoga. But if you go for the good body, you're not doing yoga. Um, so and there is, I think there is something to be said for mystery staying mystery. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's great that we want to constantly know everything, but there's a place for not knowing. Oh, there's definitely a place you know for not I mean? knowing. So now we're talking about like the whole beginning of Psyche's Veil, which is all about not knowing. Yeah. That's why you need intuition is because we're we're grasping around in this not knowing territory. But that's certainly another talk. And uh, <laughs> this is probably a good place to leave this one. Perfectly timed. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you guys. Um, I love uh, the great group. The great group.